Yeah, welcome to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is 12 o'clock block. We're doing Global Connections with Dean Neubauer. Uh, Dean Neubauer is an emeritus professor at the University of Hawaii in political science, has had a long career. There are many jobs there, many lessons, many students, many travels. Um, he's also a uh, special advisor um, to, uh, on uh, international education to the East-West Center. Welcome, welcome to the show, Dean. Nice to have you here. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. So we're talking about Hong Kong today. Uh, we're talking about, uh, gee whiz, uh, troubling things with the, with the um, new, new um, national security law, which has really turned things upside down. And we're talking about the effect of that law and the likely imp implementation of that law by Beijing um, in the academic world. Uh, so I, I'd like you, if you don't mind, to describe what is the academic world in Hong Kong? It's got a good reputation. Uh, what has it been? How famous? How how academically uh, prestigious is it? It is um, it, uh, relatively small in scope. Uh, the, historically, there were uh, eight universities in, in Hong Kong. The most recent one was the creation of the uh, University of Science and Technology uh, 35 years ago, and it zoomed up from being a newbie to being uh, very prestigious uh, in and of itself. The University of Hong Kong has been, uh, and Hong Kong Baptist University have been well-known universities for, uh, for a very long time. Uh, Lingnan University, which is the one that I've been most associated with, uh, was for many, many years the only liberal arts college uh, on the island. And it uh, had a place that which was somewhat different from the others, which were focused on uh, typical research missions of, of the contemporary university. Uh, and during the time that I've been associated with it over the last 10, 12 years, it has moved from being a liberal arts college to, uh, to being a university. And um, so the, the eight of them have uh, uh, had, had a distinguished career. They have been uh, notable over the past decade and a half, no, longer than that, two, two and a half decades for their attraction of um, regional uh, students, especially uh, at the graduate level. Uh, but the, the top universities have, uh, as you may know, there, there's a, a new ratings game. I say new, it's been really uh, in, in place for uh, 20 plus years uh, in Asia, invented by uh, Shanghai Jiatong University. And the Hong Kong universities, the, the top two, have always figured uh, very high in that. Uh, and now throughout Asia, the, the whole deal is um, where can you place in the rankings? because uh, every, every increment you get in the rankings, you get to go back to your ministry and, and say, we need more money. So, um, so what else is new in higher education, <laughs> right? But, well, go, but, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, so just to, uh, to underscore your point that these are uh, distinguished universities which uh, have had a long career and especially the tie between um, uh, British English, United Kingdom, higher education in Hong Kong goes back a century. So um, for the past couple of years, there's been what disturbance uh, uh, in Hong Kong, mostly over the extradition law, as I understand it. And the, we had the umbrella movement uh, and um, a lot of the people on the street in those protest uh, uh, demonstrations uh, we're, we're from the university. Uh, I'm thinking of Hong Kong University, but maybe others, others too. Uh, and there was a young demographic uh, who has been, um, who have been uh, demonstrating. And I wonder how that has affected or how the university or universities have affected that movement. What is the connection? What is the intersection between the student body, the faculty, and those students who have been in the streets? Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a tiny bit of a roundabout answer to uh, illustrate how, how this played out. Uh, I happened by chance to, to be there in June. Um, and uh, I, I was there on the day that um, the students at both uh, Hong Kong, uh, University of Hong Kong, uh, and the University of Science and Technology had their graduations interrupted by the students. 
at the University of Hong Kong at a given moment. They, they were all assembled in cap and gowns and the, the typical kind of thing. Uh, and at a given moment, signal from someone, they stood up and turned their chairs around uh, so that the, the speakers on, on the platform were facing the back of their heads. Uh, and uh, after about 15 minutes of that, the president of the university simply said, uh, I'm sorry, we can't do this, uh, it's canceled. Um, at the University of, of, of Science and Technology, that uh, it was played out a little bit differently. But in each of those instances, they then touched off the, uh, the demonstrations for that week. And that was the week that saw uh, the, uh, in effect, the occupation of the University of Science and Technology. Both of those universities, as you perhaps remember, are physically uh, uh, present at major uh, pathways in and out of the city. Uh, Science and Technology is right at the, the, the onset of the tunnel. Uh, that links uh, the new territories to um, to the to the island, and it th had the effect of shutting down the tunnel for uh, for the better part of a week, and so people couldn't go to work, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the the direct uh, implication of the students uh, in the demonstrations was uh, and has been significant. Uh, once again, the university that I was at uh, had the least uh, of, of that. It's located in Chengdu, which is uh, the northern part of the New Territories. Uh, in the last two nights I was there, there were significant demonstrations in Chengdu, but not at the university. And so what we were seeing during that period and what we had seen uh, in the previous several months is the uh, expansion of the demonstrations uh, away from the universities into uh, public spaces. And of course, as they became more violent uh, in the, the downtown area of, uh, of the island, uh, they resulted in uh, significant uh, amounts of, of uh, physical damage, et cetera, et cetera. By the time I had uh, come and gone uh, over a eight, 10 day period um, at, at the airport, uh, the airport had moved from its first uh, initial two occupations by the demonstrators to uh, holding uh, passengers uh, at, at a distance to the airport. So you could, you could in effect only get into the airport after you had gone through a winnowing process. And that happened to public buildings all, all, all over the island uh, as it began to, um, to shut down and to treat um, the demonstrators as, um, uh, as disruptors of whatever business uh, was going on. And that was certainly true of the universities. So one of the things, uh, and once again, when I was there in June and July, one of the things that was much in discussion is uh, to what extent um, the students are uh, a constitutive part of the demonstrations or not. Uh, and, and you could get uh, all kinds of uh, arguments about that, depending on uh, who, whom, with whom you were having the conversation. What about the faculty? Were they, um, you know, um, supporting this? Were they uh, accepting of it? Uh, did they speak at all about it? Well, they, they um, and once again, um, Dean the Outsider, uh, they uh, spoke to me in uh, what I took to be polite but guarded uh, tones. Uh, most of them were uh, very cautious about uh, expressing uh, their views. Um, when I was, uh, and once again, an external faculty from, from outside, and I was teaching several uh, classes while I was there, uh, the students were very reluctant to talk to me uh, for who knows what kinds of reasons, but, um, but perhaps the sense that they were making themselves vulnerable uh, in terms of whatever they would say to me. 
my closest friends uh, with whom, uh, once again, in order not to uh, embarrass them, I had guarded conversations, um, were, were very cagey about it because I think rightfully in terms of what has now happened uh, with this most recent law, they realize that whatever you say at point A uh, can have a lifetime in point B, point C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, one of the things that I, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about today in, uh, in the whole business of uh, what is academic freedom on the other side of the law is um, the whole business of, uh, of who's doing what. So one of the things that we've uh, seen in the demonstration and that we've heard in a variety of ways is, yeah, students are a part of that, but they're also um, professional agitators uh, in, involved in, in uh, the demonstrations. Uh, and another thing that I, I've heard much more recently than, than when I was there uh, last a year ago, June, was, um, you know, it's one thing to have demonstrations, but you have to break up all those buildings. Uh, you know, so how, how, you know, at, at the end of the day, we have to do business. And, and so you get that kind of discourse, which comes into uh, the academic freedom uh, discourse. And uh, so, so part of what uh, I've heard people begin to uh, be mindful of is uh, to, to what extent do faculty now literally have to guard what comes out of their mouth, given the fact that it's taken, what, a, a week to set up uh, the local office uh, that was premised a month ago as one of the consequences that might happen, et cetera, et cetera. And well, guess what? It did happen and it took a week. Uh, so now the issue is um, who's out there in the class? Uh, to what extent are they legitimate students? Uh, to what extent are the informers? Uh, yada, yada, yada. And uh, <clears throat> so if we put an, another face on that, uh, one, one that we're familiar from other kinds of contexts, the, the, the broad issue becomes, uh, can you have a free university in a society which is at least in terms of its basic uh, capacities totalitarian, and uh, and that's the dilemma that Hong Kong is facing. And I think uh, Hong Kong academics are are now trying to figure out um, just what constitutes academic freedom. Um, on the one hand, it's manifest in the sense that. Uh, if you're giving a class and you're uttering anti-regime kinds of statements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that's one thing. Um, but at what point, uh, if you are uh, teaching history or sociology or goodness only knows, uh, contemporary biology, uh, at what point um, are certain kinds of signals being invented external to the environment, which then become enforceable through this new uh, entity. Uh, I've just, uh, uh, prior to coming on, I was just uh, reading a, a, a bit on uh, one of my uh, feeds about how the diplomatic corps uh, has, has been ramped up to um, to be much more aggressive in in a variety of diplomatic. You mean the PRC's diplomatic corps? Exactly, exactly. Uh, I'm sorry. In, uh, but now you know the PRC's diplomatic corps uh, is 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 present in Hong Kong uh, in a way in which uh, the older boundaries are all problematized uh, in a way that I think is not at all uh, extraneous to this conversation. I've uh, been spending a lot of time in the last several years in, uh, in Australia, uh, in both Melbourne and Sydney. And the last time I was uh, in, in Sydney, uh, some of my senior colleagues in university uh, began to talk to me about how difficult their life is with enormous number of Chinese students uh, that they have 
and um, as as you may or may not may not know, uh, some some 15 years ago, Australian universities uh, said in effect, uh, these things cost too much money, and we're going to raise 20% uh, of um, our uh, our bottom line for all of the the state universities, meaning the national universities, uh, with international students. And the two honeypots for the international students have been India and, uh, and China. And originally, uh, there were a bunch of incidences that you might recall in Melbourne, where Indian students were uh, beat up and abused by local populations for any number of reasons. And um, then in, uh, in Sydney, uh, more recently, there have uh, been these instances where uh, that, that you might recall where there was uh, an effort to um, celebrate the Dalai Lama uh, and uh, 20,000 uh, Chinese demonstrators uh, showed up uh, in effect uh, and that had to be canceled. So um, that's not academic freedom. I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So so the, the you know putting putting this in the broadest possible terms the discourse of what constitutes academic freedom in these situations uh is 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 changing and um uh and, and particularly if you look um uh, in australia rather than in in hong kong because it is distinctly separate uh from china you get into the old saw about uh, what are you gonna do for money? Uh, to what extent are you selling your soul for money? Uh, and that becomes uh, a, a vibrant theme uh, currently in Australian higher education because they're concerned about all the concessions that they uh, may be making uh, as a result of that. In Hong Kong specifically, you now have, uh, to go back to the point I'm starting to make, um, is you're, you know, you're teaching this class and there are 75 souls sitting out there. Uh, how many of them are informers? Uh, to what extent, um, to what extent is the lecture that you're about to give, and I'll, I'll put Dean in that uh, situation, then, then I'll tell you an anecdote if, if you wish in a minute, sure. uh, why I stopped teaching in China. The, uh, you, you say something which in um, your conventional context uh, is absolutely legitimate uh, and an implication that you never dreamed of uh, gets thrown back uh, in your face. So here's Dean. Uh, I had been teaching at uh, a university in Shenzhen, which is up in Manchuria, uh, Northeast Normal University for you know, 10 years. I'd go up there uh, every, every year or two. And I was up there uh, on this instance because I was asked to give a guest lecture for some uh, celebratory uh, event. So here it is, maybe 250 people in the audience. And they aren't just people from the university, they're people from the community and government and whatever, whatever, whatever. And so I was asked to do a presentation. And so I put on my academic best clothes and actually a word Tai J and uh, did, did this presentation, which I thought was pretty good. Um, and uh, I, I finished on time uh, and uh, people were politely receptive, gave me a nice uh, applause, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going back to pick up my briefcase and this guy comes up to me and I, I, two people are chatting with me and he literally, and I'm not exaggerating, he literally elbows them out of the way and he sticks his face right here and he starts to lecture me about the fact that I called that thing over there Taiwan. And he is furious and you know he, he's in my face for a good three and a half, four minutes before one of my friends, you know, sees what's going on and kind of comes over and issues him out of the way. Um, but not before I had agreed to call it a Chinese Taiwan, uh, Chinese Taipei. Uh, so 
you know, pretty pretty easy to get off the beaten path. Yeah. Uh, and but is, the, is it your sense, Dean, that in China, in mainland China, um, there was a time not too many years ago, say 10, 15 years ago, when um, a faculty member could give a talk to his class and go outside the normal boundaries that he didn't have to, he didn't have to be so contained and constrained. Um, and that that has changed somewhere along the line, it has changed and faculty members are punished if they do go outside the, the boundaries of what the party would like discussed. Uh, ha has there been a kind of uh, evolution of that in mainland China? Yeah, very much so. And you can just follow it regime by regime by regime. So by the time you get to Xi, uh, you not only see all of the mechanisms that we've seen from the outside of uh, creating his, um, his own uh, sense of, of being there. Um, and, and, you know, to go back to where we were talking about the beginning, the, the uh, conversation that uh, Professor Young was uh, uh, involved in when uh, the lecture from, uh, uh, from last week, um, when she points out that, you know, his goal is to uh, be um, the distinguished uh, emperor uh, not only from the from the post Mao period, but forever, you know. So this is all about um, the new China, uh, the, the One Belt One Road, you know, the whole uh, South China Sea. Uh, you you put all of those elements together, and there is a um, there is an, a plan and an intention there. And uh, so Hong Kong is just a piece of that. And what the demonstrations served, if, if you want to put that kind of face on it, uh, is they took the, uh, the original timeline and just said, you know, well, let's throw that out the window. That's not going to happen. Uh, and we're here, folks. And if you don't like it, um, you know, do something about it. And the something that they'll want to do about it, many, uh, and, and this, of course, is what the United Kingdom saw immediately, uh, are going to, you know, take the next plane uh, out. Uh, and so, uh, the well, United uh, yeah, Kingdom I mean, it's, it's, it's really a, a terrible situation for somebody right. on the faculty. Number one is, it seems to me that uh, that she and the, and the Politburo are, you know, the, the Chinese government are, are blaming the universities for the demonstrations. The demonstrations are not good order and they require good order. This is very troubling, not only because it's happening in Hong Kong, but because that incentivizes people all over China to have demonstrations and then order is, is threatened and jeopardized, which they're not gonna tolerate. So the, one of the, it seems to me, one of the big elements of his clampdown now on Hong Kong is to make sure that he's got a handle on the people in the universities because they're troublemakers there, whether that's true or not. Um, and, and he's gonna go after them. And this law will enable him to punish them in draconian fashion, uh, ex, ex, uh, extradition without extradition. <clears throat> you bypass the whole discussion about extradition, just take them back to mainland China and try them in a Chinese court <clears throat> and sock it to them. Um, and that's pretty threatening. And my guess is uh, you only have to do a couple. Yes. So the object lesson there is extraordinary. And I would predict uh, exactly what you're saying, that precisely that's going to happen within the next uh, six months or so. Um, and, and once again, uh, you know, former students that I have who are teaching there, uh, I've been as diplomatic as, as I could, uh, trying to reach out to them and say, is there any way that we can help you uh, that, that makes sense? Uh, and they're, uh, I think, quite reasonable, reasonably being cherry about what they say in response, because nobody, Jay, nobody has the assurance that their cell phone, uh, their email, uh, is secure any longer because that law, as, as you pointed out in your previous uh, presentation, that law opens up all of those communication channels to legitimate scrutiny by, by the regime. 
And let's again, be aware of the fact that what we were talking about 10 days ago, which was the eventual uh, opening uh, in Hong Kong of, uh, of an agency uh, to effectuate the law took exactly one week. You know, so two days ago, bang, there, there it is. So now they're on the ground. Um, and my, my sense is, and I, I simply could be wrong here, but my sense is um, a very, very few people in Hong Kong expected that it would happen so quickly. And, and, I, and I think they're right now, they must be terrified because you have all these organizations that are seeking democracy, organizations that are, you know, they would like to preserve the autonomy to the extent they can, the, the basic law to the extent that they enjoyed that. And they're quitting those organizations left and right. They're, they're getting out of those organizations because they know that if they get tagged with those organizations starting, what, July 1st, um, they're going to be in deep kimchi and they'll be the targets of, of, the, of these new structures the Chinese are building to prosecute anybody who speaks against them or speaks against um, you know, the ultimate uh, one country, one system <laughs> kind of aspiration here. Yeah. But the other thing is that you, you, know, you raised the point a minute ago, Dean, about what, you know, what can they do? Um, and it's not so easy. Uh, you know, it was very nice of the UK to offer um, uh, you know, to take them in. And uh, the problem is that uh, Hong Kong, the Chinese uh, PRC, is now requiring exit visas. So it's not as if you can get on a plane and leave and go to the UK. Furthermore, and I really don't know too much about this, but furthermore, um, there was a, some possibility that the US would take them. But I'm not sure that's playing out. Are you familiar with that? No, what I, I, are the faculty doing? What are the students doing to get away from this juggernaut? Well, and, and the answer is uh, the, the timing has, uh, A, Dean is far enough away from that stuff. I'm, I'm a retired emeritus professor, and there, there is perhaps nothing more boring than having an emeritus professor try to tell you what's, what's going on uh, actually in a university, uh, because we're literally looking in from the outside. But my guess is that, um, uh, Doing all of this in the context of the pandemic is no accident uh, because the Chinese are, are smart enough, the regime is smart enough to realize that everybody's paralyzed. I mean, just look at what Britain was uh, five weeks ago and look at what it is today. Uh, look at what uh, one of the things I'm doing uh, uh, in, uh, currently right now is doing uh, an external course in uh, Taiwan. And one of the things that we're talking about are uh, vehicles for uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic and the disruptions of the pandemic. Uh, how, how do you effectuate graduate ed education, how, how, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You may have seen uh, the thing that was in the paper uh, two days ago. <clears throat> Harvard's decided that they'll have uh, freshmen and sophomores in the fall semester, and then they'll have juniors and seniors in the spring semester so that they can facilitate graduation. I mean, give me a break. You know, here you have one of the most conservative institutions in the history of the planet, uh, higher education, and you're asking them to do stuff not in a year, but in six weeks that they never dreamed of before. Uh, and so um, trying to figure out uh, how to Put the Hong Kong situation in the midst of this is uh, is extraordinary, and I, I'll simply re repeat my presumption that I don't think the timing is not wholly, but necessarily uh, accidental. Yeah, it's a it's a, matter, it's a matter of distracting people from one issue with another issue, yeah. and and playing the issues against each other. Yeah. and and you know that uh, Xi Jinping is the kind of guy who who does totally. that totally. Uh, but you know, one, one thing I would like to cover before we close, Dean, is, is, what is what is your perception from the trip and from your observation and your reading? Uh, what is gonna happen here? Uh, we start out with a, um, you know, a, a, a global center of, ed, of higher education as, as business, the same thing. And now we have this uh, extraordinary repression. Uh, we have the promise of much greater repression and punishment the loss of democracy and autonomy coming soon 
coming faster than you might think? What is going to happen um, to academic freedom, to these universities, to the faculty, um, to the students? What's going to happen? Well, my guess is that, um, and, and if we had the time, we could talk this out on a continuum. Uh, but the, uh, the reality is that there will be a good deal of learning going on in a short period of time by um, uh, universities who try this out and then try that out, find out what plays, what doesn't play. I think there will be some celebrated cases of, uh, of, of uh, academic freedom, uh, shutdowns, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and my guess is that uh, the obvious will happen. Some of those will be most likely to happen in the social sciences and the humanities where values are, are, are so important. Uh, but my guess is, and we, you know, we could put this up on, 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 on the board and see if it really happens. My guess is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there will also be some cases in um, fields like genetics where um, issues of, uh, of academic freedom are given new boundaries. And, um, and, and then there, there's something going on in all of higher education, you may have noticed, which is the uh, new interfaces between uh, industry uh, and, uh, and creativity. Uh, most of, of what we see is in the genetics uh, human frame. <clears throat> but that's going to occur in lots and lots of different areas. And so what I think will happen here is that several test cases will create uh, new boundaries. Well, what about you, Dean? Um, <coughs> you know, you, you taught over there, you, you have relationships over there, you familiar with the thing from a, you know, a 50,000 foot level and maybe a lot closer than that. Um, you're gonna go back um, do you have concern about going back? I know you know you mentioned you had concern about teaching in mainland China, but what what about going back to Hong Kong? How do you see that as an environment in which you would like to participate as a as a teacher or an advisor or uh, just a fellow who comes around as a as a uh, you know uh, an emeritus? I'm a co-director of a multi-university uh, project, which was at the East West Center for many years. And then we moved it to Hong Kong three years ago. <clears throat> it's called the, <coughs> excuse me, the Asia Pacific Higher Education Research Project, AFERB. And we've been doing annual meetings in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, with people from all over the planet. And, I'm having conversations right now with those folks about um, wh what's, what's possible, what's desirable, what's prudent. Um, I must say that uh, my view of the situation and my wife's view of the situation uh, are quite different. Mm -hmm. um, and her view of the situation is, you're not going back there. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> And have you read the part of the law where, you know, they can uh, uh, hide, hide you off to uh, mainland China and we'll never see you again, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all of us are going to have to make a decision. Uh, and, and I think part of where we are sensibly is to say, let's wait and see what that looks like pragmatically. Um, <clears throat> And that's why I say you have to see it on a continuum because there's a worst case situation and a best case situation. Yeah, who knows what other global events will intervene these days. There are so many events and, and they all have global uh, import and impact. Take your pick. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Dean Neubauer, uh, University of Hawaii, uh, for many years uh, emeritus and the uh, East West Center as an advisor on international education. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you, Jay. Nice Hello. to see you. Hello.